Hi, and welcome to the first episode of Women in Service, a collaboration between Freedom Sisters Media and Viacom CBS VetNet. I'm your host, Carrie Jeter, and I am so honored you have decided to join us today. And you're in luck because you're about to meet one of the coolest women on the planet, Meryl Tensdale. She's a retired Air Force Colonel who flew one of the coolest aircraft on the planet. She also flew rotary wing in the Navy. She is a mom, a motivational speaker, a personal trainer, and also recently she has added to her resume reality TV star as a participant on CBS's Tough as Nails. Today in part one, I sit down with Meryl to really talk about her time in service and how that has set her up for the second career and second chapter of her life beyond the uniform. So come on in, join us, and let's get started with our conversation. I'm so excited, as you can tell, to sit down and talk to you. I really, really do believe that you are one of the coolest women on the planet. And, and the more I find out about you, the more I believe that to be true. So could you just do me a quick favor and maybe tell us a bit more about yourself? Yes, I can. So a little bit more about myself. You explained that most of my, most people are interested in my 23 years, four months, 20 days service. I spent the first approximately 10 years in the Navy. I went in, in the Navy after a very long journey, starting at seven years old, I wanted to be an astronaut. And I decided I would go along this path that I started out at seven, which ended me up in the Navy in 1994. And I went to flight school, became a helicopter pilot first, SH-60 Bravos. And then from there, flew in that program for quite a few years on the East Coast, doing operations in South America, North Arabian Gulf, and Caribbean. After that, I went on to be an instructor in the new T-6 aircraft at the time that was jointly bought by the Navy and the Air Force. And from there, in about 2004, to the U-2 program under the Air Force and stayed with that program for a little over 13 years. I retired as a colonel in 2017, and now I motivate people and inspire people and keep doing me, as I say. Yeah, for sure. So you started your military career enlisted, is that right? No, I started, um, no, I started as an officer. I got my four-year degree from the University of New Haven in electrical engineering. And then I went on to, yeah, I just went on to painstakingly for a couple of months, try to find a branch of service that would give me a pilot slot. So for some reason, I thought I had read somewhere that you went to officer candidate school. So is that different in the I Navy? Or? No, officer candidate school is actually an officer course. So you have to have a four-year degree to go to officer candidate school. So that was down in Pensacola, Florida. So that's where I started my Navy service. Okay. Yeah. So I commissioned through officer candidate school as well in the army. And so, but there was a few who that was their contract. They came in with the degree with OCS. So maybe that's where I just, I had forgotten that for a temporary moment. I have learned though, that you are a Star Trek fan. So I kind of want to tie this in a little bit <laughs> onto this conversation. And so I will ask why you went to the dark side. That's not the right reference, but <laughs> I decide to join the ranks of Captain Kirk and become an officer. What about officership really spoke to you? And why did you want to be an officer in the U.S. Navy? So... Like I said, I've always wanted to be an astronaut and I knew part of that is to be a pilot. And I knew going the civilian route was cost prohibitive. I mean, I come from a single parent household in the Bronx. So, you know, my mom did really well as a single parent. So, but, you know, getting at that time, maybe 3000 a couple thousand dollars or so for flight school was not going to happen. So the military was my best option. I looked at two branches of service, primarily the Navy and the Air Force. And I found that at that time, my own personal research, more astronauts were naval aviators. I had done about two years in Air Force ROTC. At that time, I had a whole bunch of other activities. I was playing college basketball, I was doing work study. So something had to drop off and I actually stopped doing ROTC. So when I graduated college, I said, let's pursue the Navy. I actually looked at the Army and I actually took the ASVAB test after graduating to do the warrant officer program. 
I was going to sign up with the army and fly helicopters. But then the guy I was dating was a corpsman in the Navy, and he reached out to a recruiter in San Diego. I didn't know coming out of college, there's two types of ways you could be recruited. Enlisted recruiting, when you go to a, a station that you see, you know, around your town, or there's officer recruiting, like recruiting districts, which do the officer recruiting. So I did not realize there was a difference. So I finally got in touch with a district recruiter who does officer recruiting. And they said, you get out to San Diego, take the test, we'll get you a pilot slot. So I took a five day bus trip to San Diego from New York and went out there and took the test. So. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So like I said, you are so cool. I love, I love basketball. I was a basketball player myself. I was point guard. What was your position? I was a guard. Nice. Shooting guard? Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, sort of. I mean, I wasn't, I was a walk on, so it was division two. So I got, I got my share of play time. So I was doing 86% nice. from the free throw line. So that was well, not bad. Not bad. Well done. That's so awesome. So another fun fact is that you have flown fixed wing and rotary wing. Can you tell us what you did fly? Yes. So in the Navy, you know, we get trained at that time on the T-34. I went, I selected helicopters out of my flight primary training. So we go back to Pensacola and you fly to TH-57, which is a Bell Jet Ranger. There's two variants, the basic model, and then you have one that has more avionics. I don't know if that's changed. From there, I went to Mayport, Florida to start flying the SH-60 Bravo, which at that time was anti-submarine, anti-surface warfare helicopter. So we had sauna buoys, penguin missile, hellfire missile flare, the back, the air crewman in the back had uh, M60, I think it's a Gal 16 now. So we used to do a whole array of uh, mission sets that we did from search and rescue to going against small ships. From there, I became, I got out of there and became an instructor, one of four instructors to fly Moody Air Force Base, the T-6, which was a new aircraft. I went back to fixed wing flying with Navy and Air Force students. And then fast forward four years later, then I applied for the U-2 program. So I got picked up for that. We started flying T-38s, which is a fighter trainer jet that we flew. So I've flown the A, B, and C model of that aircraft. And then the U-2, of course. So um, about six different aircrafts, a couple of variants in between, but yes. Yeah. And so in the Army, we call the Black Hawk the UH-60, and you yeah. flew the SH-60, right, which is the Seahawk. Yes. So yes. what do you love about the Seahawk? Um, I, I love flying helicopters. I mean, anything for me in the Navy, flying off the back of the boat is just fun for me. Whether it was fly, flying off of, we flew off of small boys, so cruisers, frigates, and destroyers, we would dead out, but I've I've landed on probably every type of ship in the inventory during that time. So LPHs, LHDs for the Marine Corps, you know, carrier ops did a lot of. So I enjoyed, you know, boat ops. It's just fun. It's very free flowing. You have to be very flexible of the mission set because one moment you could be searching for a sub, the next moment you could be going to a boat and doing a medevac. So you you just had to be ready for anything, and I and I kind of enjoyed that about flying a flying the SH sixty, doing boat quals, or I think you put DLQs, which I was surprised you put that in there. Landing quals were fun for me, and they were challenging, so I I enjoy that quite a bit. Yeah. So and, and I did put that because I have experience um, with deck landing qualifications too. So I was like, man, I want to know what it's like to actually be the pilot flying the aircraft to do that. And so when I deployed in 2012 to 2013, we worked as the army, we worked a lot with the Navy there. And primarily that was because we lost our overwater recovery assets with the downsize of Iraq. They had moved the Navy overwater recovery assets to like a four hour flight away. And our command was like, well, we're still flying over the Gulf. What happens? Right. And so we had changed one of our medevacs. We had started just override recovery, developing this plan. And in doing that, we were like, oh, let's do deck landing qualifications with the Navy. And it just created this really cool partnership between two services that 
hadn't stood any program up like this before. And so it was really, really cool. I was the public affairs officer. So I always joke I had more flying hours than the pilots because I was almost in the aircraft every single mission to, to document the historical part of it, as well as take the really cool pictures and share it with the news. But yeah, we did a lot of deck landing qualifications while we were there. And so can you explain what that is exactly and, and maybe why it's such a tough maneuver to accomplish? Deck landing qualifications at DLQs, it's, you know, you have to, it's a certain qualification you need every year. If I remember, this is, I'm going in my memory bank. So it's important because landing on the back of the boat, it's dangerous operations. And it's not just the pilot landing on a boat. It's actually getting the boat to make sure that the lights are correct. For helicopters, for the SH-60, what a lot of people don't know is that the 60 had what was called a, a RAS system, and it was a probe that would come out of the helicopter. And what you had your fire crew, they were qualified in taking a cable from the boat, attaching it to the helicopter, and having this cable set up so it can assist in landings if the sea state was too hard for you to actually manually land. So you would actually be connected to the ship. I think that's the lamest terms I could say it. So you had to practice that at least once a year and be proficient in it. And the people that you worked with on the boat had to be proficient because you had two guys come out on the deck and do this. You know, things can happen like the cable could get wrapped around someone, wrapped around their neck. I mean, this is this is serious operations and death or injury can occur if you are not paying attention. You have another pilot in what's called the LSO shack or landing safety officer shack that is in control of putting tension on the cable. And that cable tension goes anywhere from, you know, 2,000 pounds of force tension to about 4,000 pounds as it helps assist the helicopter in. So it was, it was very crucial that you were always proficient if you were going to the boat. You may not land that way, but that was probably one of the things you had to do. And then you had to be able to land on the boat and be familiar with the ship markings on either a cruiser or frigate or destroyer or on the carrier or signals in general. So, you know, landing is, is very, you know, it's a much needed skill. If you're flying a plane, you want the number of takeoffs to equal, equal the number of landings. So 100%. 100%. even when you're describing this to me right now, like I didn't realize it was just as beneficial for the crew on the deck for, to make sure they had the qualifications as it was for the pilot to have that skill set. I just think it's so cool and so fascinating because the boats are like, they're not stationary, right? There's still, there's some kind of movement going on um, and you have to just navigate all of those elements, the wind, the waves, the crews. Yeah, no, it is. Everything from what the ship has. I, I can remember one time, you know, the ship can turn into the wind anytime, right? And, and give you great winds, but sometimes because they're trying to make a destination, they're unable to do so. So I remember I was flying and we were going to the carrier, me and another pilot, and I think we were doing the drop off. And the carrier battle group, this was the George Washington at the time, they were rendezvousing with someone and I don't remember, but they were going somehow in against the wind where it was, if we landed normally, it would have been a tailwind. So they asked us to do something weird, like, can you come across the bow of the carrier and then come in backwards and then turn and land. And as a helicopter pilot, you know, it's not, it's unusual, but you do that pilot-ish, as I say, and you make it work. So you have to, on the spot, think of, okay, how the winds are gonna affect controls and how it's gonna do it. And it was very weird to do so because you're coming up the front of the ship and now you got to turn where now you have this tailwind at your helicopter. So it was, and I was flying it and I was landing it and it was fun. It was challenging, but you just make it work. So those are things I enjoy. Love it. I loved, I love flying on the Black Hawk all the time. It never got old. Um, it was really exciting. And I just, this is why, Daryl, you're one of the coolest women on the planet. Um, <laughs> Cause you could do amazing, cool things. So after you were doing all this stuff for the Navy, you became a joint instructor for the Air Force and Navy, and yes. you went, eventually went back to a fixed airframe. But even more so, you have boldly gone, boldly gone, where no other African-American woman has ever gone before. And you flew a spy plane. 
this is crazy town. This is so amazing. And the the plane is the U2, and that community of pilots is super small. It's itty bitty. There are 1,500 men and women who have ever flown the U2, and you are one of 1,500 to be the only Black female to do so. So what does this accomplishment mean to you? And more importantly, what does this signify for women and specifically for our Black sisters? Right. So I I think there, well, I think maybe 15 and maybe a little less. I would think it's probably 1100-ish, but yeah, you know, smaller than that. Yeah, smaller than 15. Even smaller. But, even yeah. So, I mean, but it's still 65 years of the U2 and that's a pretty small cadre of people and special people. When I came into the community, I just was a person that was interested in what the U2, the mission, I was interested in the the group of people who flew it. I thought the brother slash sisterhood was actually, they seemed really cool. It reminded me of Navy days on the back of the boat in a detachment with a small group of people who knew how, who were professionals at their job. So I didn't, I did not realize the demographics of that community. I just was, I wanted to be a part of something special and as part of something unique. But now that I've done this and it, it, it became, someone pointed it out to me the day I soloed in the YouTube. And when that happened, I was, I was just like, all right, cool. Yeah. I still got so many more. <laughs> like I was like, great. I solo, but I still have to do my tactical phase and I still have to do all this other stuff and, and pass my check ride and, and do really well and, you know, be judged in front of my peers of my tactical knowledge. But once I went on my first mission, you know, again, it was all about doing the mission and being with a, a small group of people who are phenomenal professional individuals. I'm glad I did it. I'm glad that my story can pave the way for other women, other women of color, just other people who might not think that that route is for them, that other people do it. It's great that I can represent maybe someone who looks like a, a large majority of people and they say, wow, I could be like that. I'm like, yeah, you can, and you could be more. So, you know, I'm glad to be able to represent in that way. Yeah, it feels like a pretty hefty responsibility, but what I love about your story is that you were just doing something that you wanted to be a part of something special. It's not like you set out to be the first, it just so happened that that was your path. And it does open the doors. Like anytime a woman does something that women haven't been able to do before, it really does allow that mind shift to realize, wow, she was capable of doing that, which is crazy. What am I capable of? And it kind of gives you some of that internal motivation to, to walk out your own path or what you feel like you're being called to do. So I just applaud you for sticking to um, the path that you wanted from, you know, seven years old to you became this incredible pilot that so many others just hadn't done yet. Within that community, do you know what the ratio is of women to men, just in general? I think they just hired their 10th woman in the YouTube program. So, I mean, you say you have 1,100, you know, people, there's 10 women, so there's, I'm not going to do public math, so no, you, no, you, you no, know what I, that percentage I, is. I don't do public <laughs> either. It's totally all right. <laughs> that's, that's like 1%. That's, so, yeah, it's, yeah one, it's, like, it's one in, like, yeah, every 110 is one yeah. woman. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Well done. Well done, ma'am. <laughs> like, holy cow. Yeah. So I have seen you wearing this Dragon Lady shirt and your motivational um, videos on your Facebook, but you'll have to excuse my ignorance because I don't know what that signifies. Is that the nickname for the U2 or what is that? Right. So the U2 is also, yeah, is known as the Dragon Lady. So the U2, it's, it's a unique aircraft. They say, you know, it was done in 1955. If you look at my shirt. Kelly Johnson designed the aircraft. It was a Lockheed Martin. Kelly Johnson worked for Lockheed Martin. And uh, he designed this beautiful aircraft that flew incredibly high outside of, not outside of the radar of the Russians, 
but that's what it was for. And it would tick the Russians off because we, <laughs> we denied anything was happening and they were like, we know you're there. So <laughs> it was, you know, very frustrating, but the Dragon Ladies, because the aircraft, because the physiological pressures you're under, the way the aircraft flies at altitude and down below, they say you have to fight the dragon to dance with the lady. So, and that's pretty true. So the aircraft is a challenge because of its bicycle landing gear configuration. The way to land it is different from a tricycle aircraft that you would see in com commercially or privately. We have to stall the aircraft at two feet. So to maintain that, once you land, because there's no wheels on the, the wings, you actually still have to keep the wings level. And it's just a challenge. It's not, everyone does not fly the aircraft like that. So that's why there's an interview process for the U-2 and not everyone passes the interview process. Some people find it too challenging. And then you put a pressure suit or space suit on top of that and you have to fly this aircraft. It, it just ups the level. So not, it's not for everyone. Just a little bit. <laughs> just, just so you know it's interesting you say about the russians because back then and like especially moving into the 60s it was like the race to the moon right it was like the race the space oh, yeah. race was kind of going on and so you know we we leveled up right and they were probably upset by that so interesting so what about your call sign like lady dragons the nickname for the aircraft but what is or what is or was your call sign I'll be honest, I never had a call sign. Every, everyone asked me that. I, I've i had a couple of names that just didn't stick. In the Navy, I had some severe frostbite injuries. They called me Frosty for a while. That didn't stick. I was, when I started in the YouTube community, I was called Slider, didn't stick. And like, I was like, call me Teflon because nothing sticks. And that didn't stick. So, you know, Dragon Lady is probably... The closest right now just because of the show and uh, that might stick we'll see that might stick oh cool that's kind of funny i love how call signs are created uh, within the community of, of aviators and so interesting well yeah. maybe it's not sticking because you are literally so far ahead in the path that they just don't know they just don't know what to call you yet so we'll see we will yeah, see well, well get yeah the key to call signs if you don't like something you just don't react because if you do, it sticks. Like if you get mad, any any type of facial language, if someone starts saying something, it sticks. So you just got to be very deadpan when they say something. Even if, if you like it, don't make any, just be cool. Well, I would suck at that because I, as you can see, I'm super animated. I, I don't, I, I don't have a poker face, so they would know right away what a call sign <laughs> would be for me. <laughs> So I can only imagine, though, that the focus and determination for what you have done in your military career. So how many um, hours did you fly the aircraft, the U-2 specifically? And then how many times, because you had said, you know, with an altitude and above altitude. So you're you're hitting, I think, 70,000 feet above, above if, if I'm yeah. right. Yeah. So how many times did you see the curvature of the Earth as well? Oh, wow. So I have about 3,400 hours over that. Of the U2 time, I have over a thousand hours in the U2. And how many times have I seen the curvature of the earth? I mean, probably hundred. Yeah, I would say probably a hundred times or so, a few hundred times. Yes. So, I mean, most of our, a lot of our flights are high flights. They're either high flights or we're practicing in the pattern. So, and then on my missions that we've done. Yeah. So I'd say, you know, a couple of hundred times. That's remarkable. Yeah. So not as cool as that, but I've skydived a whopping one time. <laughs> and it oh. wasn't even by myself. It was a tandem. <laughs> so <laughs> I loved it. It was so much fun. But, oh, and the coolest part about it, I skydived in an, evening, in an evening gown. So the only time I did it, I was Miss Veteran America 2015. And it was for like this promotional video that we never actually used the footage for anything. But I was literally in an evening gown. That's all I had on was any <laughs> uh, it was fun it was a little chilly it was cold but it was it was crazy and it was wild and it was really really loud i wasn't expecting um it to be so loud as your before your shoot employees i'm like what is the word i don't even know that's like how. did they give did they give you earplugs yeah but it was still so it was so loud like i don't 
I don't know. And I'm hard of hearing. So the fact just the wind being so just loud by my face was crazy. And they also told me what to do to like be able to breathe the whole time. And I felt the whole time I was like, couldn't catch my breath. So I was definitely doing something wrong. <laughs> For sure. I'm not an expert. But once the, once the parachute employed, I, it was just like this crazy, peaceful experience. It was very serene to me. And it gave me a different perspective than I had ever had before. Like I've been in an aircraft, I've been in a helicopter, but to be free floating down to the earth was just like a different way to marvel at creation. And so all of that story, as funny and crazy as my experience was, is really like, I want to, in that moment for me, there were so many reflections and like a deeper connection to the greater experience of being a person on this planet. But what are your reflections from seeing the universe, because you saw the stars and you saw the curvature of the earth from the U2. When, when I see things like that, when I see those, those beautiful views, especially at night, when I, you know, there's a couple of times you fly and your vision is unobstructed by lighting pollution and you see infinite amount of stars and it looks like you're in a planetarium where they you know at night it it just makes me feel that in this world is so much smaller there's so many other great things that are maybe waiting out there for you so any little drama that's going on in your life just is very you know incredibly small like infinitesimal compared to the bigger picture out there so it just gives you this sense of calm and for me that yeah why sweat it why worry about you know any family drama or something that's going on at the squadron it's just man there's so much more out there there's a bigger picture so enjoy this moment and enjoy life enjoy being here and enjoy maybe being the highest person on earth today if unless people are at the international space station so it's you know it just gives you that it, it does give you that sense of peace and calm and just this understanding that there's just more out there absolutely absolutely and you have so many cool moments in your career and you have achieved a lot of great things in your service but none of that happens without hard work could you maybe share the hardest uh, moment in your military service I think, you know, some of, some of the hard moments and they were, I wouldn't say hard, they were just challenging is, you know, the initial going through flight school because I'd never flown before, believe it or not. I had one flight in college with a friend of mine who had his uh, license, he had his pilot's license and we went up in a Cessna, like 152 <laughs> and man, it was so turb. It was so, it was so hot that day. I started getting sick, but I kind of sucked it up, didn't say anything. And then I landed and I was like, oh man, I don't know if this could be for me. But, uh, you know, flight school in itself was difficult because I had zero hours, just like a lot of other people. So you, you know, you learn to quickly adapt and adjust and it. And, and I had an incredibly hard instructor who was hard on me, who used a lot of colorful words in the cockpit with me and demanded the absolute best from me but he was he was a good mentor he was one of my first so that was probably challenging and once i survived him uh the rest of it was not so bad <laughs> another time was you know transitioning from the navy to the air force because it's just a different they train pilots differently. There's a different mindset. Neither are right or wrong. It's just different. So, so being able to switch over at the good thing is I was at Moody Air Force Base as a Navy instructor for a while. So I got to see how the Air Force worked, but it's still kind of a, a shell shock and a transition that you have to get used to. Yeah, for sure. Johnson designed the aircraft. It was a Lockheed Martin. Kelly Johnson worked for Lockheed Martin. And he designed this beautiful aircraft that flew incredibly high outside of, not outside of the radar of the Russians, but that's what it was for. And it would tick the Russians off because we, <laughs> we denied anything was happening and they were like, we know you're there. So <laughs> it was, you know, very frustrating, but the Dragon Ladies, because the aircraft, because the physiological pressures you're under, 
the way the aircraft flies at altitude and down below. They say you have to fight the dragon to dance with the lady. So, and that's pretty true. So the aircraft is a challenge because of its bicycle landing gear configuration. The way to land it is different from a tricycle aircraft that you would see in com commercially or privately. We have to stall the aircraft at two feet. So to maintain that, once you land, because there's no wheels on the, the wings, you actually still have to keep the wings level. And it's just a challenge. It's not, everyone does not fly the aircraft like that. So that's why there's an interview process for the U-2 and not everyone passes the interview process. Some people find it too challenging. And then you put a pressure suit or space suit on top of that and you have to fly this aircraft. It, it just ups the level. So not, it's not for everyone. Just a little bit. <laughs> just, just so you know it's interesting you say about the russians because back then and like especially moving into the 60s it was like the race to the moon right it was like the race the space oh, yeah. race was kind of going on and so you know we we leveled up right and they were probably upset by that so interesting so what about your call sign like lady dragons the nickname for the aircraft but what is or what is or was your call sign I'll be honest, I never had a call sign. Every, everyone asked me that. I, I've i had a couple of names that just didn't stick. In the Navy, I had some severe frostbite injuries. They called me Frosty for a while. That didn't stick. I was, when I started in the YouTube community, I was called Slider, didn't stick. And like, I was like, call me Teflon because nothing sticks. And that didn't stick. So, you know, Dragon Lady is probably the closest right now just because of the show and uh, that might stick we'll see that might stick oh cool that's kind of funny i love how call signs are created uh, within the community of, of aviators and so interesting well yeah. maybe it's not sticking because you are literally so far ahead in the path that they just don't know they just don't know what to call you yet so we'll see we will yeah, see if well, we'll get yeah the key to call signs if you don't like something you just don't react because if you do, it sticks. Like if you get mad, any any type of facial language, if someone starts saying something, it sticks. So you just got to be very deadpan when they say something. Even if, if you like it, don't make any, just be cool. Well, I would suck at that because I, as you can see, I'm super animated. I, I don't, I, I don't have a poker face. So they would know right away what a call sign <laughs> would be for me. <laughs> So I can only imagine, though, that the focus and determination for what you have done in your military career. So how many um, hours did you fly the aircraft, the U-2 specifically? And then how many times, because you had said, you know, with an altitude and above altitude. So you're you're hitting, I think, 70,000 feet above, oh, if I'm yeah. right. Yeah. So how many times did you see the curvature of the Earth as well? Oh, wow. So I have about 3,400 hours over that. Of the U-2 time, I have over a thousand hours in the U-2. And how many times have I seen the curvature of the earth? I mean, probably hundred, yeah, I would say probably a hundred times or so, a few hundred times. Yes. So, I mean, most of our, a lot of our flights are high flights. They're either high flights or we're practicing in the pattern. So, and then on my missions that we've done, yeah, so I'd say you know, a couple hundred times. That's remarkable. Yeah. So not as cool as that, but I've skydived a whopping one time. <laughs> and it oh. wasn't even by myself. It was a tandem. <laughs> so <laughs> I loved it. It was so much fun. But, oh, and the coolest part about it, I skydived in an, evening, in an evening gown. So the only time I did it, I was Miss Veteran America 2015. And it was for like this promotional video that we never actually used the footage for anything. But I was literally in an evening gown. That's all I had on was any <laughs> it was fun it was a little chilly it was cold but it was okay. it was crazy and it was wild and it was really really loud i wasn't expecting um it to be so loud as your before your shoot employees i'm like what is the word i don't even know that's like how did they give, did they give you earplugs yeah but it was still so it was so loud like i don't i don't know and i'm hard of hearing so the fact just the wind being so just loud by my face was crazy. And they also told me what to do to like be able to breathe the whole time. And I felt the whole time I was like, couldn't catch my breath. So I was definitely doing something wrong. <laughs> For sure, I'm not an expert. But once the, once the parachute employed, 
I, it was just like this crazy, peaceful experience. It was very serene to me. And it gave me a different perspective than I had ever had before. Like I've been in aircraft, I've been in a helicopter, but to be free floating down to the earth was just like a different way to marvel at creation. And so all of that story, as funny and crazy as my experience was, is really like, I want to, in that moment for me, there were so many reflections and like a deeper connection to the greater experience of being a person on this planet. But what are your reflections from seeing the universe? Because you saw the stars and you saw the curvature of the earth from the U2. When, when I see things like that, when I see those, those beautiful views, especially at night, when I, you know, there's a couple of times you fly and your vision is unobstructed by lighting pollution and you see infinite amount of stars and it looks like you're in a planetarium where they, you know, at night, it, it just makes me feel that in this world is so much smaller. There's so many other great things that are maybe waiting out there for you. So any little drama that's going on in your life just is very, you know, incredibly small, like infinitesimal compared to the bigger picture out there. So it just gives you this sense of calm. And for me that, yeah, why sweat it? Why worry about, you know, any family drama or something that's going on at the squadron? It's just, man, there's so much more out there. There's a bigger picture. So enjoy this moment and enjoy life, enjoy being here and enjoy maybe being the highest person on earth today, if unless people are at the International Space Station. So it's, you know, it just gives you that, it, it does give you that sense of peace and calm and just this understanding that there's just more out there. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you have so many cool moments in your career and you have achieved a lot of great things in your service, but none of that happens without hard work. Could you maybe share the hardest uh, moment in your military service? I think, you know, some of, some of the hard moments and they were, I wouldn't say hard, they were just challenging is, you know, the initial going through flight school, because I'd never flown before, believe it or not. I had one flight in college with a friend of mine who had his uh, license, he had his pilot's license, and we went up in a Cessna, like 152, <laughs> and man, it was so ter- it was so, it was so hot that day, I started getting sick, but I kind of sucked it up, didn't say anything, and then I landed, and I was like, oh man, I don't know if this could be for me, but, uh, you know, flight school in itself was difficult because I had zero hours, just like a lot of other people. So you, you know, you learn to quickly adapt and adjust in it. And, and I had an incredibly hard instructor who was hard on me, who used a lot of colorful words in the cockpit with me and demanded the absolute best from me, but he was, he was a good mentor. He was one of my first. So that was probably challenging. And once I survived him, uh, the rest of it was not so bad. (laughs) <laughs> Another time was, you know, transitioning from the Navy to the Air Force because it's just a different, they train pilots differently. There's a different mindset. Neither are right or wrong. It's just different. So so being able to switch over, at, the good thing is I was at Moody Air Force Base as a Navy instructor for a while. So I got to see how the Air Force worked, but it's still kind of a, a shell shock and a transition that you have to get used to. That concludes part one of our conversation with Meryl Tinsdale, but I'll tell you, isn't she one of the coolest women on the planet? Now, for me personally, she might be the number one coolest woman on the planet after listening to her stories and what she did in uniform. It's really spectacular. We have a second part to this conversation, and I really hope you come back and enjoy that with us as well. We're going to talk more about who she is today as a mom, as a reality TV star, and as a motivational and personal trainer. You don't want to miss part two, so join us for that. Until next time, keep sharing your stories.